and the ad team. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Just as a reminder, the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film about movies or otherwise are solely those of yours truly, your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. Also, just as a reminder, you're listening to Words on Film on bostonfreeradio.com, watching and listening to Words on Film on Summerhill Community Access Television or some community access TV station somewhere in the country that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast, and then I say thank you, or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. And I have three new movies to review for you for this show. I could only do three because it's the end of the summer, and... It's, it's going to be in with the fall pretty soon, so it's kind of slow around this time of year. But first, let me get into my first seg- segment, which is what's topping the box office. These are the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. Many of them are hits, some of them are flops, but I'll let you know the difference as we go along. And there's really not much that has changed compared to last week. Last week, the number one movie at the box office was Crazy Rich Asians. This weekend, it was Crazy Witch- Rich Asians. Number one at the box office for the second week in a row, having grossed $24.8 million this past weekend. Now, against a budget of $30 million, Crazy Rich Asians has so far grossed $76.6 million in the United States alone, and around the world it has grossed $83.9 million, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world in just two weeks, so very good for that movie. Number two at the box office last week was The Meg. Number two at the box office this week, it is is also the Meg, having grossed $12.8 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget ranging from $130 to $178 million, somewhere in that range, the Meg has so far grossed in the United States $105.1 million at the U.S. box office. Around the world, it has so far grossed $411.6 million, which means that here in the States, it's surprisingly not a hit, but around the world, it's actually doing really well. And and is a certified hit in every other country around the world. Now, the number one debut movie at the box office is actually number three at the box office this weekend. That is The Happy Time Murders, starring Melissa McCarthy, which debuted at a decent $9.5 million in the U.S. Around the world, it's grossed $10.7 million, which means that in every other country besides the United States, The Happy Time Murders has so far only grossed a combined $1.2 million. So that's not not off to a great start, especially considering that its budget is somewhere between 40 and $47 million. But I can't count it as a flop yet because it is, after all, only its first week, and it may pick up in the coming weeks. Of course, we will have to see. Mission Impossible Fallout is number four at the box office this weekend, as it was actually last weekend, having grossed $8.1 million at the U.S. box office last weekend. Against a budget of $178 million, Mission Impossible Fallout has so far grossed $194 million here in the States and $538.8 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States. And it may not ever be a certified hit here in the States, but it may not matter because around the world it is most certainly a certified hit. Mile 22 is in its second week in release, and this is the one that's probably changed the most. Last week it was number three at the box office. This week it fell to number five, having grossed $6.4 million at the U.S. box office. Against a budget ranging from $35 to $60 million, that's $60 million, Mile 22 has so far grossed $25.5 million here in the States, which is not especially good, and just $30. $31.8 $31.8 million worldwide. And even though it's in its second week in release, it may or may not be a tentative hit around the world, but here in the States, it is most certainly not a hit of any kind. But that may change in the next couple of weeks, but considering its position in the top 10, it is doubtful that it may recoup its budget. Disney's Christopher Robin is number six at the box office, actually just as it was last week, having grossed $6.3 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $75 million, Christopher Robin is actually 
just grossed 70, excuse me, has just grossed $77.6 million in the United States, and around the world it has grossed $114 million, which means in its fourth week in release, it is a tentative hit here in the States, and pretty close to being a certified around, hit around the world, but it is a tentative hit also around the world this week so far, and it may reach certified status, but it will probably take the movie quite a while. Alpha was number five at the box office last week. This week it slid to number seven, having grossed an even $6 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $51 million, Alpha has so far grossed $20.6 million at the U.S. box office so far, and around the world it has grossed $28.4 million, which means it's neither a hit here in the States and around the world, and given its position at number seven in its second week in release, it doesn't look like it's going to recoup its budget, but then again, miracles do happen. Black Klansman is number 8 at the box office, sliding slightly from number 7 last week, having grossed just $5.1 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of just $15 million, Al, uh, excuse me, Black Klansman has so far grossed $31.8 million at the U.S. box office so far in just three weeks, and around the world it has grossed $40.4 million at the U.S. box office, which means that despite the fact that it didn't stay in the top five in its three weeks in release so far, it is already a certified hit here in the States and around the world, so very good for Black Klansmen. Number nine of the box office is Slenderman, which slid from number eight last week, having grossed just $2.8 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget ranging from 10 to $28 million, Slenderman has so far grossed $25.4 million here in the States and $33.5 million worldwide, which means it's not clear whether or not Slenderman is even a tentative hit here in the States yet, but around the world it has already eked its way to being a tentative hit. It just hasn't grossed nearly as much as previous horror films, ranging from the bad, like Truth or Dare, to the excellent, like Hereditary, but it's not looking particularly promising for Slender Man, and it may be a tentative hit if it's lucky. And finally, the second... Highest grossing debut movie of the week is number 10 at the box office, and that is AXL, which grossed $2.8 million in the States this weekend, $3.4 million around the world against a budget of $10 million, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world. Imagine if I told you that an earthquake was going to hit tomorrow right where you live. That it would be 6.5 in magnitude with aftershocks occurring twice 25 minutes apart. You'd no doubt talk with your loved ones and you'd make a plan today. It's true, I can't tell you an earthquake will happen tomorrow. But what if it does? Shouldn't you have a plan? Visit lacounty.gov slash emergency and make your emergency plan today. Don't wait. Communicate. Brought to you by the Los Angeles County Office of Emergency Management, FEMA, and the Ad Council. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is evening gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more. Making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is The Happy Time Murders, which is a black comedy crime film that also happens to feature puppets. And not just puppets, actually, I would say probably semi-official Muppets in the sense that the movie is directed by Brian Henson and also features puppet work from major Muppeteers such as Bill Beretta, amongst others. And The Happy Time Murders is a Henson production, but it's under the Henson Alternative um, studio. It's It's definitely not under the Jim Henson Company, because otherwise people would mistake this for a Muppet film, which it isn't really. And the puppets that are in this film are never once referred to as Muppets. As a matter of fact, none of the Muppets, the classic Muppets from Kermit the Frog to Big Bird to any of the Fraggles are even mentioned in this film. So the the movie certainly pays tribute to the Muppets in a twisted kind of way, but also distances itself from its more family-friendly fare. But The Happy Times Murders takes place in a universe where 
humans and puppets coexist, but not exactly in harmony. And when the puppet cast of a 90s children's TV show by the name of Happy Time begin to get murdered one by one, a disgraced LAPD detective turned private eye puppet takes on the case. And that private eye puppet is named... is named Phil Phillips, and he is both puppeteered and voiced by Bill Beretta, who has also been the Muppeteer for several more well-known Muppets, and which ones I can't exactly tell you, but in any event, this disgraced private eye by the name of Phil Phillips is working in his own office and is distancing himself from the LAPD, but once these murders start cropping up he is eventually paired with a hard-nosed detective by the name of connie edwards who is played by melissa mccarthy in this movie and there are some other human actors that make appearances in this film among them is elizabeth banks who actually plays the only human cast member of happy time by the name of jenny and there's also phil phillips Secretary Bubbles, who's played by Maya Rudolph. And there are also some other appearances from some pretty well-known actors and comedians. And this movie is rated R. I'm not sure if that's necessarily going to distance children from this movie. I know this movie came out probably any time before 2005. It'd be one of those films, very much like South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, which kids will want to see, but parents will, of course, not want them to see. And maybe that hasn't changed, but with YouTube airing some pretty messed up uh, videos involving animation and even puppets, I don't think there's very much this film hasn't seen that kids haven't already seen on YouTube, if not worse. And there is a lot of R-rated material in this film, maybe even close to the NC-17 rating, but then again, this movie tells you a little bit more than it shows, particularly when it comes to the really dirty WTF moments. As a matter of fact, there are some dirty puppet moments that really made me laugh. In fact, there's one scene where a a puppet is trying to get into a a cab, and he's cut off by a human, and he says something that's a little off-color to that human. That part made me laugh. There's also a part where Phil Phillips is visiting a porno shop that's run by puppets, and there's a literal turkey that's behind the counter that is filming a porno as he's running the shop. And when you see the curtains actually separate you see a pretty sick porno involving a an octopus that is um shall we say giving pleasure to a cow and once the turkey actually said that the the video he's shooting is cows gone sour too that made me laugh quite a bit there's also an, another scene involving the puppet phil phillips having sex with a femme fatale puppet that enlist his services in in solving some murder and the the way that that puppet actually (laughs) the the way that sex scene goes down really made me laugh as a matter of fact the happy times murder while not perfect in in terms of its story and a little bit predictable in terms of how the mystery is going to resolve itself made me laugh a lot more than the movie from two years ago, Sausage Party, which was a CGI animated film that was rated R, which I thought, even though it had some funny parts, I thought it was a little bit too desperate to be dirty and just make you laugh in poor taste. I I actually thought that if they focused a little bit more on making that movie, Sausage Party, funny and a little bit less on making it dirty, I actually thought it would have been funny without compromising its R rating. But instead, that movie just kind of threw things at you. And The Happy Times Murders... The Happy Time Murders does actually fall into that trap a couple of times. As a matter of fact, I would probably say about 60% of the gags in this movie, whether they be genuinely funny or purposefully R-rated, worked. And another 40 kind of fell like a, a brick. In other words, they fell flat, and they weren't quite as funny as 
they intended the movie to be. But overall, I enjoyed myself with the Happy Time Murders and the fact that this is made with a relatively big budget ranging from 40 to 47 million dollars and not quite the lower budget of the equally off color. Uh, Peter Jackson directed Meet the Feebles, which was a sick and twisted tribute to The Muppet Show that came out in 1989, and which I recommend, by the way. And as a matter of fact, Peter Jackson did direct that, and if you were to have told me way back when I saw that movie that the person who directed it would go on to create one of the greatest movie trilogies of all time, let alone win an Oscar for it, I would have thought you were absolutely crazy. But The Happy Time Murders, even though it was somewhat unoriginal and plot. I did appreciate it for its off-color humor and also the amazing special effects that they had with the puppets that only somebody who's associated with Muppets could probably pull off. So The Happy Time Murders is a funnier film, I thought, than Sausage Party, and it gets my rating of a high checkout. Again, I, I do think that some of the puppets were really funny. The humans that interacted with the, with the puppets weren't quite as funny. Like, for instance, I actually expected Melissa McCarthy to be funnier than she was in this film, but she wasn't bad. Certainly not as bad as she was in a movie like Tammy. So I give Happy Time Murders a Hello, marginal recommendation. It's me, the designer jeans in the back of your closet. What happened to us? I used to summer in the Hamptons and now I'm stuck behind a pair of sweats. Okay, maybe I never really fit you right, but I got a lot more Sunday fun days left in me. So take me to Goodwill, where I can really make a difference. Your donations to Goodwill create jobs, training programs, and education assistance for people in your community. To find your nearest donation center, go to goodwill.org. Donate stuff. Create jobs. A message from Goodwill and the Ad Council. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston, Boston Come, Come Through. Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, hey. social events, what? And the Black Experience. Okay. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is AXL. This is a PG-rated film that was written and directed by Oliver Daly. And what's interesting about this film is that he, um, Oliver Daly actually debuted this film or a version of it as a proof of concept short film that he funded via Kickstarter. So this is Oliver Daly actually expanding his previous um, short film from 2015 to the big screen. And were the efforts worth it? Actually, this movie was quite better than I expected it to be. One of the disadvantages that AXL has in being released right now is it's released at the same time as a similar themed movie alpha which is also about a man and his dog the only difference between alpha and axel is that alpha takes place present day excuse me axel excuse me axl so many mistakes here. AXL takes place present day, whereas Alpha takes place literally in 18,000 BCE. And also, AXL is a robotic dog, whereas Alpha was a wolf. So, in any event, AXL is a top-secret robotic dog who, in this movie, develops a special friendship with a biker... A, 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 with a biker by the name of Miles, and will go to any length to protect his new companion. So, Miles in this film was played by a young actor by the name of Alex Neustadter, or I, at least I hope that's how his last name is pronounced. He's been in a couple of movies so far, nothing huge. He was in a TV show called Colony, and also a couple of movies called Ithaca and Walking Out. Walking Out came out last year, but I didn't get the chance to see it. I see a lot of movies per year, probably between 80 and 150 per year, but I don't see everything. Some movies 
come right under my radar. But in any event, how is Axel as a movie? Well, I do have to say that I actually enjoyed it a little bit better than Alpha. But it still wasn't a perfect film. This movie is kind of marketed as the Iron Giant, except instead of the Iron Giant being a huge android robot that resembles a human, it's a dog instead. And I also didn't quite get how AXL, or Axel as its newfound owners call him, is able to have emotions such as fear. That was never really explained to me. Also, you get a little bit of a sense of why Axel was created. In fact, there are there's a certain amount of footage in this movie that shows the creators of the of this robot who are almost modeled a little bit after Steve Jobs and going into their reasons as to why they created this robot. Of course, it's a government funded project and AXL is supposed to be a robotic dog that's used in in combat during wars, which is a very valid reason to create this robot. But what I didn't understand and what was told and not shown in this movie was why AXL ran away from its lab and also why it was cowering in fear when this kid Miles found it. It it shouldn't have fear. It's a robot. Why would it be in hiding? So that wasn't particularly explained well to me. But I did actually like the the footage of what was going on in AXL's brain or on its mainframe as it's interacting with such humans, where it how it functions itself to trust some humans over others. I thought that was actually pretty cool. And the love story in this movie between this kid, Miles, and also another girl named Sarah, who's played by a singer by the name of Becky G, I thought was a little predictable, but somewhat genuine. The two actors had decent chemistry alongside each other, but once you actually see Becky G, you kind of know that she's going to be the love interest. I I guess that's, that's a little predictable, for, for this kind of movie. And I did actually like the story. There were, there were times where I didn't quite know where this, the story was going. Other than the love story, I thought the rest of it was a, a little less than predictable. But again, I did think that the, the subplot involving the AXL dog and how it functioned and how it ended up borrowed a little bit more from the Iron Giant than it should have, and as a result, it did lack the emotional depth of movies such as The Iron Giant. And you can tell that a movie is good when the center of the film is a robot like The Iron Giant or some other film like that, and you feel emotion for something that basically runs on AA batteries. Not a lot of movies have been able to pull that kind of emotional resonance off. Like, one of the movies that probably failed to have me relate to a robot on the screen was AI, which was directed by Steven Spielberg, based on a concept by Stanley Kubrick. That movie should have been a lot better than it ultimately was, but maybe it was the ending they they tacked on at the end that maybe lost me. But in any event, I was watching the film, and I couldn't quite fear for or emotionally relate to the robot in that movie and i couldn't quite emotionally relate to the one in this movie as well and i think one of the biggest deus ex machinas that might have ruined this film was axl's ability to regenerate and repair itself to a certain extent once you see in this movie that somebody has damaged the robot in some way that I won't reveal, it doesn't have as much emotional resonance because you know that the dog can ultimately create itself again, in in which case, what's the point? But AXL was still a better movie than I expected it to be. I did think the human lead Alex Neustadter was a little bland and his love story was indeed predictable, but the special effects on that dog robot I thought were incredible, and even though it was CGI, it looked like a real robot. Maybe it was a a mix of CGI and robotics, but I thought it was actually some very cool special effects. I give kudos to Oliver Daly for creating such a 
a, a masterpiece, at least in terms of special effects. And it gets my rating of a checkout. It was a lot better a film than I thought it would be, but it still needed some improvements. I wasn't prepared to be a caregiver to mom. I had no idea how hard it would be and what I would need to know. Things I never thought of, like how to improve her mood and ways for me to stay positive. Luckily, I found the Caregiving Resource Center from AARP. It had articles about the basics, but also information about the hurdles I was facing. Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org caregiving. Articles, tips, and tools to help you both care for your loved one and care for yourself. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. This is Alan Patterson, and I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, Old School R&B, Soul, Blues, Jazz, Gospel, Folk, Old School Country, Zydeco, All Music New Orleans, Rockabilly, Bluegrass, World Music, Comedy, Poetry, and Spoken Word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Papillon, which stars Charlie Hunnam and Ramik, excuse me, Rami Malik, and is directed by Michael Noer, who is a Danish director who I haven't actually seen any of his previous films, but he's directed a number of documentaries up to this point. Uh, there's one he directed in 2010 called Son of God, which received a nomination, but not an Oscar nomination. But he's directed a number of other films that have been fictional, including Northwest, R, and his most recent one before Papillon, which is um, uh, a Dutch name that I can't quite pronounce, so I'm not going to. But anyway, Papillon is a remake of a film that was released in 1973, sort of. It's And that movie starred Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman. And it is actually, both those films were based on the 1969 autobiography by the French convict Henri Charrier, who went by the nickname Papillon, which I believe in French means butterfly. And Papillon tells the true story of Henry Charrier, who is a safe cracker from the Parisian underworld, who is convicted of murder. Whether or not that's false, the movie doesn't really explain because you're you're given a little bit of background behind uh, Henry Charrier's life as a small-time safe cracker living in Paris in the early 30s, long before World War II breaks out. And you only see him get convicted of murder because somebody or some police came to his apartment and arrested him. You don't actually see the murder take place. You don't even get a sense of whether or not Henry Charrier, who is played in this movie by Charlie Hunnam, actually did it. But in any event, he is sent to a penal colony in French Guiana for his alleged crimes, which may or may not be true. The movie doesn't even begin to elaborate upon whether or not Henry Charrier was at least even indirectly involved with this murder, let alone whether or not he did it. But in any event, he is sent to a penal colony in French Guiana, where he meets a counterfeiter by the name of Louis Dega, who in this movie is played by Rami Malek. And even though Rami Malek doesn't sound like an American name, Rami Malek is actually an actor from the Los Angeles area, who you're probably going to hear a lot about in coming months, because he is actually starring in 
a film called Bohemian Rhapsody, which is about the band Queen, and he will be playing Freddie Mercury in this in that movie. I can't guarantee whether or not that movie is going to be good, but rest assured, you'll be seeing a lot more about Rami Malek in the later months, whether the film is good or bad. So, eventually... Henry Charrier and Louis Dega conspire to break out of this French Guiana prison. And because French Guiana is in South America and is surrounded by jungle and sea, they are not only going to have to break out of the prison, but also survive the outside world beyond that and somehow make it to freedom in one piece without literally killing each other so you would think that a movie that's not only based on a true story but based on a real account by the person who lived it would be intriguing but this movie drags so much the first hour of the movie i found myself nodding off and it it felt like you were actually watching this prison stay, particularly when Charlie Hunnam's character, Henry Charrier, is in solitary, it feels like you're watching this in real time, which drags the pace of the story to a crawl. And once actually Henry Charrier and Louis Dega begin to conspire to escape prison, and when they ultimately make their attempts for escape... That's actually the most interesting part of the film. But that doesn't happen until the second half of the movie. And as a result, this movie doesn't feel as as great or as appealing on an emotional level as other movies like The Shawshank Redemption do. And it's really unfortunate because I would bet that if I read Papillon, I, I haven't actually read it, but if I did, that movie would be... Probably, excuse me, that book would be a real page turner. But unfortunately, Papillon doesn't translate that excitement to the screen. And it did have a chance to actually make an intriguing film back when they made it in 1973 with Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman, two excellent actors. But unfortunately, that film bombed critically and commercially. Actually, it didn't bomb commercially. On a budget of $13.5 million, the 1973 film made $53 million at the box office. But it was a critical failure, and I don't think that it received very many... It, it was nominated for Best Music and Best Dramatic Score, and it got a Golden Globe Award for for Steve McQueen for Best Motion Picture Actor in a Drama. But other than that, a lot of critics look back at that film and find it to be draggy and boring. And even though I can't compare this 2017 film, and yes, it was made in 2017, it debuted at last year's Toronto Film Festival, I can't compare that film, this one that was just made, to the 1973 film because I haven't seen the latter. But I can tell you that Papillon is a big miss. Even though Charlie Hunnam and Rami Malek act pretty well in this film, it's just draggy. And also, when, not spoiling too much, Henry Charrier makes his final escape, it's not explained how he's able to really get back on his feet and survive extradition or even live a comfortable life after prison. It just goes right from his unlikely successful escape to his basically living the high life as he's publishing his novel. So there are pieces of this movie that had they been put into the film and in place of all these long, drawn-out, boring expositions, it would have made for a much intriguing film. But unfortunately, Papillon gets my rating of a strikeout. It's not badly acted. I think there is, there will eventually be a movie that Charlie Hunnam will star in that will be good. Hopefully... He'll get his chance in the next couple of years, but I have the feeling he has something good coming. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. 
Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. From the hub of the solar system to the world, bostonfreeradio.com. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society, race is a topic that affects us all, and yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I only reviewed three films for you for this show because it's the end of August and therefore the end of the summer season for the film industry. And eventually, I think after... Labor Day weekend, where I'll be back. There's going to be a whole onslaught of great fall films that are coming out. But now, the summer season is actually not officially over, uh, weather-wise, until September 21st. But the, the summer season for... The movies is just about winding down as kids who are in school are going back to school of all ages. So in any event, my point is that I'm out of new films to review, so I might as well give you a rundown of movies that are coming out on DVD and possibly on streaming for today. August 28th, 2018. And the big film, the primary film that's coming out on DVD and Blu-ray is Tag. And that is a movie that came out earlier this summer. Tag, just for those of you who don't know, is actually based on a true story. But very lo- the, the film is, of course, fictional and using original characters to tell the story. And it's one of those films I didn't have any expectations for as I was going into it. But it's probably one of the funniest films of the year. And it completely blew my mind how funny this film was. So it's about five childhood friends who are played by Ed Helms, John Hamm, Jake Johnson, Hannibal Buress, and Jeremy Renner, who, despite the fact that they are adults, still keep in contact with another by playing an elaborate game of tag. And they go through a number of really creative and, I guess you could probably say, comically desperate (laughs) tactics to tag their friends and one of the friends who's played by jeremy renner is the only friend in the group that has never been tagged so he's the ultimate goal for whom to tag and it's a really funny movie the the five guys in this film work really well together there are a number of really surprisingly good special effects involving stunt work particularly on jeremy renner's part and also the people who are not involved in the game of tag like ed helms on-screen wife isla fisher also jeremy renner's on-screen fiance leslie bibb in addition to other supporting actors and actresses like annabelle wallace rashida jones and nora dunn they all do really well in this film so i have the feeling that tag's going to be one of those films that it did pretty well at the box office but it's one of those films that people are going to be coming back to again and again and it's it's going to be probably a minor cult classic another film that's coming out on dvd blu-ray and probably streaming is book club and this is the one of the sleeper hits of the early summer the movie is very much like a nancy myers film it's about upper middle class 
senior citizens who are lifelong friends who have their lives forever changed after reading Fifty Shades of Grey in their monthly book club. It's directed not by Nancy Myers, but by Bill Holderman. And Bill Holderman certainly directed this film like a Nancy Myers movie, but he's also actually um, he's produced another film that's coming out in theaters later this year called The Old Man and the Gun. But this is the only film he's directed, Book Club. He's he's also he also wrote the the screenplay for this movie. And it stars Diane Keaton, Jane Fonda, Candace Bergen, and Mary Steenburgen, uh, who are still you know active in movies. And even though I wasn't crazy about this film and I didn't exactly think Putting Fifty Shades of Grey was the most original thing to do in this film. And also, the way that the four women resolve things in their lives isn't exactly tied to Fifty Shades of Grey in this movie. I still liked the chemistry between the four actresses. And I I did laugh at some of their happenstances throughout this film. So, I do think that older viewers will like this film and younger viewers may not but they also won't be turned off by it i think i gave it my rating of a checkout when i reviewed it for this show but moving on another film that's coming out on dvd blu-ray and possibly streaming probably streaming is one called upgrade which very much like axl is a movie i walked into not really expecting very much from but this is a science fiction film in the same kind of vein as blade Runner. It's directed by Leigh Whannell, who is an Australian director who has brought us several other... uh, Actually, he's only directed one other film other than Upgrade, and that was Insidious Chapter 3, which I haven't seen, but I heard some good things about it. But Upgrade is set in the near future where technology controls nearly all aspects of life, but when Gray, a self-identified technophobe, has his world turned upside down, his only hope for revenge is an experimental computer chip implant called STEM. So Upgrade is kind of like Blade Runner meets her, but I... I enjoyed this film a lot, and Logan Marshall Green was a really good lead in it. And I I just, I I appreciated this film, and I think that this is another film that's that's good for friends, particularly guy friends, but maybe even girlfriends, to watch at midnight. And I, I would imagine that Upgrade would be one of those films that would probably not be out of place at a midnight screening. It certainly has that appeal to it. So it is out on DVD, Blu-ray, and probably will be out on streaming very soon. As a matter of fact, it's available now on Prime Video if you want to check it out. And another film that's coming out actually today on DVD and Blu-ray is one called Water Walks Ahead. And this is a movie that I had actually never heard of until <laughs> until I actually saw it on the DVD and Blu-ray releases for today. And I don't actually have the information for this film, let alone that this is a movie that I actually haven't seen as of yet. But it is coming out in... Uh, it, it's called... Why did I write Water Walks Ahead? It's Woman Walks Ahead. I'll explain more about that. Come on, smile. Oh, honey, he's still not smiling. Maybe he's not a smiler. Yeah, maybe he's just not a happy baby. Maybe he's just being a boy. Or maybe he's teething. Maybe it's just a phase. Maybe he has autism, and we can definitely do something to help. Maybe is all you need to find out more about autism. No big, joyful smiles by six months is one early sign. Learn the others at AutismSpeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. I love those real six signs. They're the ones that move me. The thinly blow. <laughs> Rocky Toe Yadu 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 Yadu
Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Getting back to my list of movies that are coming out on DVD, Blu-ray, and streaming, depending on the service to which you subscribe, I was discussing the movie Woman Walks Ahead, which I erroneously described in the last break as Water Walks Ahead. I guess that goes to show you how much um, I was writing that fast before I came in to do my show. But Woman Walks Ahead is a movie that does star Jessica Chastain, and she plays Catherine Weldon, who is a portrait painter from 1890s Brooklyn, who travels to Dakota, which I guess in the 1890s was one state, to paint a portrait of Sitting Bull, and she becomes embroiled in the Lakota people's struggles over the rights to their land. Now, this movie I don't remember coming out in theaters. It probably came out in very, very limited release, which is kind of surprising, especially given Jessica Chastain's star power, not to mention her indie cred. Well, you know, she, she's one of the few notable actors who has both of those advantages, but unfortunately... This movie wasn't given a wide release in theaters, but fortunately, it is out on DVD and Blu-ray now, and you can see it by way of Prime Video. Will this movie be nominated for any Oscars? I really can't say. I can't tell you whether it's good or bad, but I can tell you that it is out out on DVD, Blu-ray, and Amazon Prime right now, so I suggest you... I or I... I I don't think I recommend that you check it out, but if you want to check it out, it's there. Another movie that is out on DVD, Blu-ray, and is actually available on Amazon Prime is Mary Shelley, which stars Elle Fanning as the 18-year-old wife of poet Percy Shelley, who, as this movie depicts, she is actually inspired to write the immortal novel Frankenstein, which actually made her surpass Percy Shelley in terms of being well-known amongst literary circles today. Of course, people who are poetry fanatics know Percy Shelley very well, but Mary Shelley's probably got more of the mainstream attention. And Elle Fanning's been doing a lot of films. I think she's one of those actors like Keegan-Michael Key and... Adam Driver, who you just see in uh, about everything right now. And, and she's a good actress. Now, I have not seen Mary Shelley. It's one of those films that I do actually remember being in theaters, but I didn't get a chance to actually see it, so that one passed me by. But if you want to see it, it is out on those channels right now. Another movie that is out on DVD, Blu-ray, and Netflix streaming, in addition to HBO On Demand, is one called Paterno, which is about Joe Paterno, the head football coach of Penn State, who in this movie is played by Al Pacino. And Joe Paterno, who, after becoming the most successful coach in college football history, is embroiled in Penn State's Jerry Sandusky sexual abuse scandal. So even though Joe Paterno himself didn't molest any boys, unlike Jerry Sandusky. His his involvement or in the circle of Jerry Sandusky challenges his legacy and forces him late in his life to face questions of institutional failure regarding the victims. And Joe Paterno, the real Joe Paterno, died before the Jerry Sandusky case was fully resolved. And Joe Paterno did receive an auspicious, shall we say, uh, wake or memorial service when he died. But still, his, his legacy hasn't entirely recovered because of his involvement with the Jerry Sandusky sex scandal. So that's what this movie Paterno in, involves itself with. And I have not seen it, but it's actually the third collaboration between Al Pacino, director Barry Levinson, and HBO. Previously, Al Pacino played real life controversial figures Phil Spector and Jack Kevorkian. 
just had to remember the name there, for other HBO films. And I did see the Barry Levinson-directed You Don't Know Jack, which starred Al Pacino. And Al Pacino did an amazing job portraying Dr. Jack Kevorkian. I, I didn't see his movie where he played Phil Spector, but I heard it was really good. And Paterno has gotten some good reviews, but I personally haven't seen it. But if you want to see it for yourself, it's on DVD. It's on. It might be on Blu-ray. I don't know, but it probably is. It's definitely on... Amazon Prime, and it is also on HBO On Demand. So check that out if you get the chance. Another film that's coming out on DVD, Blu-ray, and is available for streaming on Prime Video right now is American Animals. And this is a movie that is both a drama and a docudrama, and it's about four young men who mistake their lives for a movie and attempt one of the most audacious heists in U.S. history. And it involves actually taking rare books from their college library. It's directed by and written by Bart Layton, who did a really good job with this film. And Bart Layton has produced a number of films in terms of films he's directed this is his feature film debut the other movies he's directed have been documentaries all but one of which have been broadcast on tv but this is his first time directing a movie that is a a drama but also certainly showcases his documentary skills and i did think the actors who played the four college students here did really well with their roles. I especially liked Evan Peters as Warren Lipka. And the the four actors also, the four people who were involved in the real cr- crime also make an appearance in this film, which shows that they didn't quite get away with it. That's not exactly a spoiler. The, the movie kind of allows you to extrapolate that information in the first couple of minutes but american animals is a pretty good film and that one i do recommend you check out it's not exactly a fun film and it does end somewhat dramatically but it is an independent film excuse me an independent film that is worth watching i certainly got a lot out of seeing it and i think that those of you who are Uh, able to get it on DVD, Blu-ray, or on Amazon Prime, if you subscribe to Amazon Prime, will enjoy it as well. There's certainly a number of exciting moments, particularly considering this is a heist film. Adopt U.S. Kids presents Multiple Choice Parenting. You've messed up your daughter's haircut. Do you, A, it's spiritual. Mom, where's the mirror? Beauty is within. Oh. B. Find the positives. Less time blow drying, more time texting. Or C. Show empathy. Mom, you really don't have twinsies. I kind of love it. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. For more information on adoption, visit adoptuskids.org. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt U.S. Kids, and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers! With your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and now it's time for my segment, What's Coming Up Next? This is a spoken word preview of movies that may or may not be coming to a theater near you this coming weekend. And I will definitely tell you what movies are going to be in limited release and what movies are going to be more mainstream. There aren't many of them, considering that it's Labor Day weekend. And you would actually think that Labor Day weekend would be a time where people would go out to the movies, but that's not necessarily the case. It's kind of like the 4th of July. In other words, people probably want to get that last unofficial day of summer to go out to the beach or do some do a last uh, you know, barbecue before getting back to the thick of things with school and work, but Again, there there are still some new films that are being released for Labor Day weekend, and one of them is a movie that's called Kin. This is an action sci-fi film, which is about the following. 
Chased by a vengeful criminal, the feds and a gang of otherworldly soldiers, a recently released ex-con, and his adopted teenage brother are forced to go on the run with a weapon of mysterious origin as their only protection. So that doesn't tell you a lot, but it tells you enough to at least make me interested. The movie stars Carrie Coon, who who I'm not entirely familiar with. It it also co-stars James Franco, Zoe Kravitz, and Dennis Quaid, all of whom I am far more familiar with in terms of their acting. Carrie Coon is a relatively young actress. She is, as of right now, 38 years old. Actually, 37. She'll be 38 in January. And she has been in a number of movies recently, including uh, Avengers Infinity War, where she played the role of Proxima Midnight. She was in Gone Girl as Detective Margot Dunn, and she was in The Post, starring Meryl Streep and Tom Hanks, as Meg Greenfield. So this is her first starring role in a film, at least as far as I know, and she certainly co-starred in films with a lot of heavy hitters and this movie is certainly no exception but Kin is a movie I will definitely see and I will review it for you for next week's show. Another movie that's coming out this coming weekend is actually not coming out this weekend but tomorrow that is August 29th and that movie is Operation Finale and this is a movie about a team of secret agents set out to track down the Nazi officer who masterminded the Holocaust this is a movie that takes place in 1960 and it stars Oscar Isaac Ben Kingsley, Melanie Laurent, and Lior Raz. This movie looks incredible. I know that Oscar Isaac is kind of like the millennial Al Pacino, or should I say the Generation Y Al Pacino. In other words, not only does he look a lot like Al Pacino, but he also has a number of films that Al Pacino would have jumped at the chance to star in if they had come out in the early 70s. I mean, certainly movies like A Most Violent Year or the one he did with the Coen brothers, the the name of which escapes me, would have appealed to a young Al Pacino. But in any event, Operation Finale does look like an incredible film. I can't hype it up too much because I haven't seen it and... I will see it definitely this week, and I will let you know what I think about it come next week's show, but I will tell you that it packs a lot of promise. Another movie that's coming out in limited release is a movie that's called The Little Stranger. This movie stars Domhnall Gleeson, Ruth Wilson, Josh Dillon, and Charlotte Rampling. It's a horror film that is about a doctor who, after he is called to visit a crumbling manor, begins to see strange things that occur within this manor. And I gotta tell you, even though I don't watch movie previews, I I can't help but see movie posters. And the movie poster for this film is is creepy as hell i i gotta say it's it shows this this face that's in a painting that's looking to the right and the upper half of his face in other words from the nose to the forehead is torn off as if it's this this old picture and even though you don't see any blood or anything it still looks really creepy almost like the nine inch nails video closer so the movie is directed by lenny abramson who is an irish director who has brought us such films previously as room which came out three years ago and stars brie larson in her in the role that got her an academy award so as far as i know this film is the first venture into horror that Lenny Abramson has done. I could be wrong about that, but as far as I know, it is. And that is a movie that might be coming to a theater near me. If it does, I'll review it and I'll let you know what I think about it for next week's show. In the meantime, that just about wraps things up with Words on Film for this week. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and as always, Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. Just as a reminder, the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film about movies or otherwise are solely those of your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees working at the station or the station's...